We'd like to welcome you this evening, or this afternoon. Time's flown, it's already into the evening. I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to this class called Keeping Freshness in Your Ministry. This class will be co-taught by Steve Johnson, who is a campus minister at the, the Great Lexington Church in Boston. My name is Bill Lawrence, and I'm the campus minister for the Northwest Church in Seattle, Washington. Before we begin, let's have a, let's have a prayer and talk to God. Father, we thank you so much for this, this afternoon. We thank you for this great gathering. I want to thank you so much for the ways that you are moving on our campuses today, all across the nation. And Father, I pray that you will um, just bless our ministries. Father, we pray that we will offer our ministries to you as a glory, and that we'll just offer them up as a sacrifice to you. Please mold them in the ways that you want them to be. I pray these things in Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going, try, going to try to share several concepts with you this afternoon. I'll be talking for 30 minutes, and, and then Steve will be coming and talking for 30 minutes. We're going to try to, to share some basic principles on how to keep freshness in your ministry and, and back those up with some uh, examples from our own ministries in Boston and in Seattle. I don't know why they, uh, why they chose the two of us. I'm glad that, that we're working together. I've been in Seattle four years. That's a long time for a campus ministry, maybe these days. And um, maybe I need some freshness. Maybe that's the reason they chose me to, to do part of this topic. I'd like just to give five basic points this afternoon. And they're very, very simple, and yet things that I believe we need to be very conscientious in our campus ministries. Number one, I think we as campus ministers, we as campus leaders in our ministries need to, uh, in order to maintain this freshness, this innovation in our campus ministries, we need to carefully maintain our own quiet times with God. If, uh, if you're like me, you are constantly talking to your students about maintaining their quiet times, maintaining that spiritual time every day in the Word of God, maintaining that spiritual time with with a, with a positive prayer life with God. And, and I don't know uh, any other way to do the work that we're involved in than for us as ministers just to be in to that book and into prayer. I don't know how we're going to accomplish the task that God has given us without maintaining a, a spiritual quiet time in our own lives. And that thing can, can slip away from us if we're not careful. And uh, if we preach to our students, we need to be preaching to ourselves that we need to be maintaining that spiritual quiet time. If Satan can attack us and can destroy our, uh, our personal life with God and destroy that personal freshness that we feel every day by maintaining that close fellowship with God, then he's destroyed our own ministries. He's destroyed hundreds of people with us. If he can get to us and... Uh, and, and talk to us in that way, and I'm speaking from, from experience. I'm speaking from times in my life that I let that quiet time slip in my life. And those are times that, that I need to, to repent, and I've already repented of, because we need to maintain that quiet time. I find that, that I just really need to learn that, that principle in Luke 9, that I need to die to myself every day. Because in my ministry, the Lord needs to be the controlling factor. Bill doesn't need to be the controlling factor. And the longer I stay in my ministry, the, the more I think, God, I can, I can take this aspect over. I can do this by myself. And I need to learn to, to have that cross daily in my life. I need to keep my own spiritual life together, or I'm not going to maintain my freshness in my ministry. We need to, to likewise be constantly talking to our students about their own personal quiet times. We need to ask them how their spiritual relationship is going with, with, with God. And um, we devised one area that this past year, during the school year at, at, at Seattle, to try to improve our students' quiet time. Every week we gave them a, um, a guide that we called Quiet Time Power, that we gave them some, some uh, specific things to pray for. This was a, a prayer guide and some specific uh, things that they needed to be doing every day in, in praying. We... Um, we prayed for a different campus ministry every week from all over the Brotherhood. And we, we prayed uh, by name for that campus minister and the special needs that, that we knew of in that ministry. 
and hopefully a lot of your ministries have been strengthened because people have been praying for you in Seattle. We prayed for, uh, another day we prayed for a missionary that was out on the field, and we encouraged our students to write that missionary and say, we're praying for you. These are your special needs that, that you have. One day a week, we, uh, we just decided that we'd take God serious, and we'd start praying for our government leaders. And so we had a different leader every week that we prayed for. It might be the mayor of Seattle, it might be President Reagan, it might be our senator, but we, uh, we took God seriously and we started praying for those people, and I believe God's blessed us as a result of that. And the last day of the week, we did this for four days and tried to give our students some structure in addition to their, the rest of their quiet time. We prayed for an unevangelized country in the world. We, uh, we took a, a nation that didn't have any missionaries of the church, and we researched out that nation. We researched key areas that, that needed to be prayed for, key cities that, that the gospel needed to penetrate, key uh, uh, peoples that, that didn't have the gospel, uh, whole groups of people that don't have the, the Bible translated into their language. And we prayed for those. And I believe very fervently in the power of prayer. And so we need to, to carefully maintain quiet times in order to keep freshness in our ministry. Number two in my, my part of this is that, and this is uh, going to knock you over, I know, is something very astounding, a way to, to maintain freshness in your ministry, but we just need to be constantly converting people into our fellowship. Uh, if we're not constantly bringing new people into our fellowship, there's no way we can be fresh. That's where our freshness comes. That's where our, our newness comes. That's where our lifeblood comes, is by bringing new people into our fellowship. Uh, we need to learn from our new Christians. We need, to, we need to open up our lives to their ideas and their talents and what they can offer the body of Christ. And we need to learn from, from those new Christians. I speak again from experience. The longer you are in an established ministry, the harder it is for you to schedule time with the unsaved. When I first moved to Seattle, we had three students that were members of the church four years ago. And it was, it was real easy to schedule time with the unsaved because I couldn't spend a whole week with those three students. And now when, when you have upwards of 150 to 175 college students, uh, your time is just, you're being pulled from one extreme to another. Uh, you need to be counseling. You need to be discipling. You have a lot more administration than you had before. And those things are very important or very vital. If you're not discipling, then you're not doing what you need to do in your ministry. But hand in hand with that and along with that, don't overschedule your time to where you personally, as the campus minister or as a leader in your campus outreach, don't overschedule your time where you are not spending time yourself with the unsaved, where you are not spending time working with people that aren't in the body of Christ. There's no better way to keep freshness in your personal life. You go stale if, you, if you're not out in the world. And we need to, if we're, uh, if we're telling our students that, if we're expecting our students to be out seeking and saving the lost, then we better be out seeking and saving the lost also. Third point that I'd like to bring up is that we need to, um, to have a realization in our ministry that sometimes the methods that we employ need to change to better promote the message. We don't need to become uh, bound in the tradition of the particular kind of method that we know about. Our ministries uh, need to have flexibility to change, uh, to communicate the unchangeable gospel. The gospel never changes. But very frequently, we need to evaluate the methods that we're using to communicate that unchangeable gospel because we need to uh, promote that flexibility. Each one of us comes from very unique situations. We come from unique universities. We come from unique communities. And because of that, I sincerely believe that every one of our ministries ought to be different from each other because we're ministering to a different group of people. We're ministering to... Um, uh, a different community, we're in different kinds of, of churches, and we need to, uh, to be very flexible. And just because we're flexible in the kind of methods that we use is no excuse whatsoever to change our focus from the purpose of Jesus Christ in seeking and saving the lost. There's no excuse to change that. Sometimes I feel that we have the temptation to... Um, uh, and, and it's a temptation that's very hard to resist in duplicating 
uh, exact methods of, uh, of ministries that are very successful or perhaps ministries that we were trained in. And, and we need to thank God for the ministries that we were trained in. But it's, it's, um, we, I think we need to resist that temptation of always duplicating exactly uh, the, the, the exact same methodology that we might have been brought up with because things change. New ways can come into existence. We need to be very innovative. There's a world that is lost and that's dying that is yet unreached by the gospel. There are groups at our campus that are yet unreached by the gospel, and we need to be innovative. That's not saying that you can't do a lot of the same things that, that are done in other places. I'm not criticizing doing programs the same way that are done in, in other areas of the country. All I'm telling you is that we are all unique. We're all individuals. We have individual needs, and we need to be flexible enough uh, to, um, to adapt and to change in those individual needs. Uh, we're in the process of, of training ministries, training ministers to go out and start new ministries all over the Northwest and the West. And we tell our people that we train that, that please be flexible. If you see something that, that you can do that's different than what we've been doing in Seattle, don't just copy what we've done in Seattle. Do something to the glory of God that's going to better promote the message, and then maybe you can come back and teach us what you're doing. Please be flexible. Uh, just a case in point, probably one uh, method that that the majority of us use is um, some, kind of a, some kind of an evangelistic Bible study, uh, dorm Bible study. And I, I believe in dorm Bible studies. I believe in a small group evangelistic studies. Our ministry is totally committed to it, but I think we need to be even open to, to changing that. Um, a case in point, we, um, we almost had to, to go to different methods last fall at the University of Washington. We live in a very restrictive state as far as freedom of religion. And several times we had uh, people escorted off campus by campus policemen uh, trying to prevent us from having Bible studies in dorm rooms. It's the way they interpreted our state constitution in the separation of church and state. And just because they tried to shut our Bible studies down doesn't mean that we, that doesn't relieve us of the, uh, of the, um, the command and the charge to go out and evangelize that campus. Now, we thank God that, that things have changed through a lot of prayer, and uh, our Supreme Court has changed some things in the state of Washington, and that's helped quite a bit. And they're no longer harassing us like they used to be. And that, that's, that's great. But we need to be flexible enough to know that, that we maybe can't be tied forever to that method of reaching out to people. A time may come, again, when our state prohibits us from doing that. But that does not excuse us from, from being flexible. And... I, um, I sincerely believe that, that we need to maintain that flexibility. We need to maintain that, that innovation. Um, our campuses change. Our lifestyle changes. The values of our students changes. And with that, we need to change the methods to communicate the unchangeable gospel. Another way, the one that I want to spend the majority of my time on this afternoon, is that we need to devise new ways to reach groups that are yet untouched by the gospel. Our ministries are, um, are, should be complex in nature. We're ministering to communities and we're ministering to universities and to college, colleges that are, that are full of subgroups. Our universities are divided into different kinds of groups, people that, that hang around together in different groups. And the more that we train ourselves and the more that we penetrate these different subgroups in our campuses, uh, the more effective and the more complete our campus ministry is going to be. If we uh, only reach out to students that are living in the dorms, then we're ignoring large, large segments of our, um, of our student population. And we need to, to identify those subgroups. We need to identify the areas of people that we need to reach into. Uh, we found out that, that a tremendous amount of commuter students uh, to go to our campus at the University of Washington. We have the, the largest campus on the West Coast, and yet the majority of those people are, are commuter students. And so we have to devise ways to, to reach into those commuter students. We have to have studies available for them. Uh, that's not to say we can't concentrate in the dorms. Um, we have a tremendous variety of, of learning situations in Seattle where we have private uh, universities that are church-backed. We have a tremendous amount of community colleges, and we need to to learn new ways to reach these people. Um, 
even subgroups within your university itself, like your, uh, your frats and your sororities. Right now we're trying to, uh, to penetrate into, uh, into the athletes at the University of Washington. Our school is, um, is trying to, uh, to be known as, as there's more than one football school on the West Coast besides USC. And um, that's fine with us, but we just want those athletes to be Christians. Um, and so we're, we're going to try to start new studies specifically just for the Husky football team because that's a, a tremendous amount of, of camaraderie between those people. We already have football players going to our fellowship, so we're going to utilize that. We already have Christian football players, so we're going to penetrate that. We're going to start special groups to reach out to different subgroups on campus so that we can reach, uh, reach our students. One thing I want to spend some time on, a subgroup, it's been covered a little bit in the last session in uh, how campus ministry can affect the world, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it because I have a tremendous burden for it. And whenever you have a burden, you've got you to get it off your heart. You've got to share it. We need to be penetrating into our international community in, um, in, our, in our colleges and universities. I am firmly believe that we need to evangelize the world and I also firmly believe that the most effective way to evangelize the world in the Churches of Christ is to do that through our campus ministries. Uh, case in point, when we first arrived in Seattle, we converted a young man named Oswaldo Bustillo, who was majoring in forestry at the University of Washington. He was from Honduras. He, uh, he was baptized during the first year. He uh, married one of our girls, went back to Honduras. Uh, to work uh, in for the government of Honduras. I, uh, after last year's seminar in Boston, flew down to uh, Tegucigalpa, Honduras, to visit with Oswaldo and Becky. In the six months that they had been there, the congregation had grown from, from 20 in attendance to over 90 in attendance. And it's not all, of course, due to the work of Oswaldo and Becky Bustillo. But a large amount of it was them coming and working with established American missionaries, people who could uh, relate to the culture. I'm very, very much in favor of us evangelizing international people and sending them. A Japanese person can go back to Japan much more effectively than I can go to Japan and convert Japanese people. And we have literally hundreds of thousands of students on our campuses all across the nation that we need to be reaching out to, and people that are very open. Foreign student population is increasing every year. Uh, in, the, in the next few years, it's estimated that 10% of our total enrollments in U.S. colleges and universities will be international students. Many universities are already over that limit of 10%. And that's a tremendous constituency that we need to be reaching out to. And so I believe you need to just concentrate and devise special programs to reach out to these people. Last summer we started uh, two uh, international uh, evangelistic Bible studies. We found a, um, a language program, an ESL program, where students were coming from all over the world and learning English. These are, they're very open to have communication with, with Americans. They're very open to knowing Americans. And so we started those, those two, those two um, studies. And in this past year, we've had students from over 60 countries attend our, ser our uh, services at church just as a result of that, that, that little outreach that we made down to the Catholic University downtown in, in downtown Seattle. Um, it's thrilling to communicate the gospel to people who have never heard about Jesus Christ. Um, I, had the, I had the opportunity last winter to, to, to gather in a group uh, of, with international students and there, was, uh, there were students there from Hong Kong and Taiwan and mainland China. Three different Chinese cultures, three different Chinese governments, and they were all there, and they didn't fight. They didn't get into political discussions. They didn't start talking about ideologies, but they centered and they talked about Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to be doing. Uh, presently, we were very much involved in, in a bilingual Japanese-English um, uh, outreach. We have a lot of Japanese people in, in Seattle. And you need to be uh, forming ties to missionaries all over the world and, and to church leaders in these different countries because you need to be able to tie them in when they leave. We're trying to be very acquainted with the church situation in Japan and trying to, to figure out what we can do 
uh, to evangelize Japan from Seattle because we have such a tremendous uh, amount of, of Japanese people that come back and forth every day between Tokyo and Seattle. And that's a tremendous way to, to communicate the gospel with freshness. Uh, it's just such a thrill to sit down with someone and to freshly talk about the life of Jesus and what he's done for you and how he was triumphant over the grave. And it's a thrill that I can't really communicate with you today. But please, please, go back and, and start communicating that gospel cross-culturally. It'll, it'll, it'll enhance your ministry. It'll enhance your own personal life. It'll give you great freshness. Another group that I think we overlook in our campuses are our parents. A lot of us are, are converting uh, hundreds of students every year, and yet there's a whole... There, families that are, that are not yet reached yet. And, uh, and we saw other ministries having and even experienced some in ourselves, uh, some, some tension developing because students were coming into a, a committed relationship with Jesus and they were uh, experiencing a lot of tension with their family. And so we tried to, um, uh, to do a little PR and to, and to build some bridges to our parents and we uh, borrowed a, an idea from Maranatha Ministries, incidentally, uh, observe groups like Maranatha and IV and NAVS and, and they don't have the, the doctrine right but they got some good things going. If we were in the world like IV and NAVS we'd be a lot further along in, in promoting the gospel than we are today. Let's learn from these other groups. We uh, borrowed an idea that it's called Parent Appreciation Day and uh, I didn't have a lot of faith to be real honest on what was going to take place but we sat down and I wrote a had a, my secretary type a personal letter to every parent uh, in our college and university class, inviting them to a special Sunday that we were going to have to honor them. And we sent these out wherever our students lived, whether it be in Washington or, or across the nation. And we planned a special service that, were, that was going to be led entirely by our students, explaining how they appreciated their parents and what their parents had done for them. And we had a tremendous, it was a tremendous blessing. We had parents drive from as far away as California uh, to come and to be a part of that. We had, um, we had the largest attendance that we've ever had, period, on, on Sunday morning because of Parent Appreciation Day. And we've had Bring Your Neighbor Day for a long time, and we always have tremendous crowds at, at that time. But we had a, a bigger attendance than we've ever had on Parent Appreciation Day. And I... I encourage you to do that. We built excellent bridges. We have parents that are now, it just happened three months ago, but we have parents attending local churches, local churches of Christ, back where they came from, as a result of, of building those bridges. It was excellent for them to see that their students were appreciated, and I, I do encourage you to do that. Uh, in conjunction with that, we had um, one of our interns, uh, uh, father come. He had, he had become a Christian after his son became a Christian. We had him come and speak to our students and tell them exactly how it felt to be a parent who was not a Christian and then how it felt to, to come into the Lord and, and what his son and his daughter-in-law did to help bring him to a faith. And that was a tremendous thing. He could do, he could communicate a lot better than anyone else could to do that. I encourage you to, to do things like that. We need to be reaching our families uh, for, of our college students. And then the last thing, very quickly, before Steve takes over here, is that I believe we need to provide some interaction between uh, different age groups in our congregations. I think it's very vital and very imperative for the unity of the church to have interaction between all different age groups. I think the day is over that we are a, a separate and, and entity from the church. The college group must be uh, totally integrated within the university I and mean, within the, the congregation itself. Um, our students need to see the whole church in action and not just one small group in the church. Uh, they need those examples from the parents. They need the examples from the adults. They need those examples from, from the teen group. And the only way those examples are going to be provided if this, uh, there's just some more interaction than, than takes place on a normal uh, Sunday morning. Uh, Paul was very explicit in his instructions to Timothy on, on how young men and young women should be trained, and that's should, to be done by the older men and the older women. And that's, that's, a, that's a command from Paul. We need, to be, we need to be careful of that. We need to be implementing that in our ministries. Um, in our particular ministry, 
there were some tensions that were developing, uh, kind of the, uh, the evangelism gap between, between the university and between the adults. Um, the university was a very evangelistic group, and they would look at the adults and they would ask questions. They would wonder why. And uh, what we did to help bridge that gap was, um, and I don't recommend you doing this in all situations, but we disbanded Wednesday night services altogether and we uh, developed a program that we call Life Groups where now the whole congregation is divided into uh, evangelistic cell groups where they reach out in, into communities, into their own community, uh, where it's given some structure to our adults and allowed them to have the same kind of structure that we had in the, originally in the dorms. And it's provided a, a very beautiful working relationship between our students and between um, our adults, and it's, it's integrated them in an evangelistic situation and it's been very instructive for our adults and also very instructive for our students. Um, if we're going to be serious about reaching into urban areas, if you're from an urban area, you're going to have to, to go where the people are. And many times the people aren't around your church building. Um, our, our church is, in, is located right in Seattle, but we have, we have these evangelistic groups in three different counties on uh, the western side of the mountains. And so we need to, to be serious about reaching into an urban area. Um, please, please leave and, and, and learn that, that we need to be flexible. We need to, to have a freshness in our ministries or, or we'll die. If we don't have this, this new life, this freshness will die. I'm looking forward to what uh, Steve is going to be sharing with us. And I invite your careful attention to, uh, to pay uh, very close attention to him. Thank you, brother. I'd like to say amen to the things that Bill has shared with us. Let's just all stand up for just a second. Just go ahead and everybody stand up. This class is supposed to be over at 7. Is, is that right this evening? <laughs> Steve Blicker, would you go to the, the front desk for me, brother, and have them cater dinner down here to us? That way we won't be interrupted or anything. No. Everyone, if you would, just take a, a deep breath, tilt your head to the left, and breathe out. That way you won't all breathe out this way. Have a seat back down. We'll get things... Going back here in just a second. Steve Blicker and I not only have the same names, we have other things in common. We're both legends in our own mind, but it's good to be able to get together at times like this to see so many brothers, to spend time like this together. Uh, I don't know if when you were standing up, you noticed by looking around that, uh, that the new has worn off on a lot of us. The new wears off on things so easy. My, my car isn't new uh, anymore. I've had it for two years. And the new has definitely worn off my car. Someone wore a lot of it off last week when they ran into my wife uh, in the rear, and they just wore off all the new in the back corner there. And uh, uh, the new has worn off lots of times because I don't treat the car the way I did in the beginning. And just like with us, the, the new wears off a lot of things. Uh, many of us, by the time we can finally afford to wear designer jeans, we find out we don't have a designer body anymore just because, you know, the new wears off after a little bit of time. Boy, that went over well. I might use that one tomorrow. Uh, but I'd like you to look in 2 Timothy chapter 2. I believe that in all of our ministries, and, and we look across the room here, there are people from, from all sorts of backgrounds, from all really different places in the congregation, ministers, ministers' wives, elders, elders' wives, uh, your regular Joe Christian, all, all types of people here. And yet with all of us, I hope that, that we're here, you know, to, to be able to learn how to keep that freshness that we started our Christian life off in. Remember what it was like when we were first baptized. Remember what it was like when we first became a Christian. Remember that, that zeal, that fervor, that enthusiasm. And, and no matter what we say or how we try to pat it, the new wears off of things. It does. But you look in 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, and Paul says, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David, this is my gospel for which I'm suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal, but God's word is not changed. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now, have you ever thought how strange it would be to tell a minister of the gospel a preacher that is supposed to be spending, you know, all of his time ministering to people, teaching Jesus, how strange it is that Paul would tell Timothy, oh yeah, by the way, Timothy, remember Jesus. You know, I can imagine Timothy going, oh yeah, I almost forgot about Jesus. That's right, that's what we're doing this about, right? You know, I mean, the fact is, 
that Paul was trying to aim Timothy towards the same thing that motivated Paul every day of his life. If it was not for the cross, if it was not for the life that led Jesus up until the time of the cross, then Paul says, I wouldn't even be here, but because of Jesus, because I remember Jesus. Timothy, you remember Jesus. But because of Jesus, not only am I in chains, but even though I'm chained, the gospel's not chained. So what Paul is saying is that his circumstances did not affect what he believed and what he taught and what he did. And we, of course, know that even though Paul was in prison, he kept on preaching. And Paul's preaching led all the way into the household of Caesar. Now, that's just how much Paul was not willing to let his chains affect the gospel. The circumstances were not going to affect how he felt and what he did. And so, in the same way... Our ministries, our lives, yeah, after a while, some of the newness goes off. We get accustomed to being a Christian. We get accustomed to living a a committed life, a dedicated life, a life holy for serving to Jesus. But sometimes, because of just, you know, things going on and on, you know, and and it becomes a daily sort of grind, then the new wears off. Preaching led all the way into the household of Caesar. Now, that's just how much Paul was not willing to let his chains affect the gospel. The circumstances were not going to affect how he felt and what he did. And so, in the same way, our ministries, our lives, yeah, after a while, some of the newness goes off. We get accustomed to being a Christian. We get accustomed to living a a committed life, a dedicated life, a life holy for serving Jesus. But sometimes, because of just, you know, things going on and on, you know, and, and it becomes a daily sort of grind, then the new wears off. And that does affect how we feel, don't it? Or do it? How do you say that in Chattanooga, Calvin? Doesn't it? That does affect our, how we feel. And sometimes we, we need something like this to say, okay, how can I be fresh? How can I be like I was in the beginning? And I hope, if nothing else, that the things that Bill and I share today will give you some ideas about what you can do in your congregations. And I hope that some of the things we share that you will go back and put them uh, as an active part of your congregation. Some of the things, they might not fit. It may not be apropos in your situation. But I hope we give you some ideas that you can use. But more than anything else, I hope the things that we share will get your mind spinning and for you to say, yeah, and I could do it this way or I could do that and get some more ideas going. This is what happened with me just really in the last couple of months. Uh, I'm a Rocky fan. I'm a Rocky addict. You know, the movie Rocky, Rocky 1. I like that. Rocky 2, Rocky 3. In fact, on Memorial Day, we declared it Rocky Day. And uh, my brother-in-law got one of these uh, video recorders, and he got Rocky One and Rocky Two. And uh, we went over to his house, and we, you know, we, we got out, you know, the the soda and the popcorn, and we sat down there, and we watched Rocky One. And then we turned on, and we watched Rocky Two. You know, by that time we'd done about a million push-ups and sit-ups, you know, and yelling and screaming, you know, go Rocky, go on, you know. And then we got our, our wives, and we went out, and we went to see Rocky Three. And so. Uh, uh, we were really excited. By the time Rocky stepped into the ring to, to fight, uh, you know, to fight that old, old Clubber Lang, I was in the ring with him, you know, and every time Clubber began to swing, I was like, no, don't do it, you know, and because you were there, you'd gone through it, you got ready. But there was something about this last movie, and for those of you that haven't seen it, I'm not going to spoil it, but there was something about it that really moved me, and it moved me enough to make a change in my life. And that is, in this last movie, the, the whole emphasis all along about Rocky has been that he was fighting, you know, for fighting to show that, he was some, show, show that he was somebody. He was fighting, you know, for his wife in the second movie. And before that, when he was fighting to prove that he wasn't a bum. But in this third movie, there's a different aspect to it. We see a more polished Rocky. We see a Rocky that has been, as his manager says, civilized. We see a Rocky that, you know, now holds Carter Blanche cards up. And we see a Rocky that is, that is smooth, that is suave, that is, that is nice looking. He's tapered down. He looks almost like I do. You know, we just see a guy that's really sharp. But there's something that's different about him. There's something that's different about him. Apollo Creed says he, he no longer has the eye of the tiger. You see, now Rocky doesn't have anything to prove. Now he is the greatest, and he can go out and he can fight lesser fighters, but now that that desire, that goal of striving of being the best, is not there anymore because in his mind, he has arrived. He's there. And so we find him stepping into the ring with, with Clubber Lang, and Clubber demolishes him because there's a difference. Clubber Lang is hungry. He's thirsty. He wants to be the best. And because he wants to be the best, he annihilates Rocky. And then we see an interesting thing set up in the movie. Apollo Creed comes along and says, Rocky, what you didn't have is what you had that first time in the ring with me. 
that eye of the tiger. He said, you were hungry for it. He said, I didn't have it and you did and you won because of it. He says, Rocky, we're going to get together and we're going to go back and you're going to have the eye of the tiger. Well, we see Rocky going back and he begins to train and the idea is that he goes back to the basics. And that's what I want to share my points about today. Going back to the basics. We see that Rocky goes back to a club, you know, with a, a, a fighting club with Apollo Creed. And Apollo begins to just teach him all over how to fight, but all along giving him the incentive to go back and to take the championship because he doesn't have any more and to get that eye of the tiger, to get that thirst, to get that hunger, to go back in the beginning. And I just love it in that fight when Rocky, you know, starts taking the licks again because, you know, up to this point in that last fight, he's doing pretty well because he's fighting like Apollo Creed. But for those of you that have seen it, the thing that, that always impressed me about Rocky is he could take a pounding in the face like no one. I mean, that was the thing I liked about him. Is he wasn't that smooth, he wasn't that sharp, but he could take a beating and you could beat on him, you could beat on him, but he never went down. Well, now in this last fight, it's almost too easy. He's floating like a butterfly, stinging like a bee. He is messing Clever Lang all up, but then he changes. He changes his strategy. And he starts letting the guy hit him in the head. And hit him in the head. And this might be violent for some of you, it's just a movie. Hit him in the head, you know, and hit him in the head. And he lets him hit him. But, you know, the thing is, he starts saying every time he hits him, he says, it ain't so bad. He hits him again, it ain't so bad. He hits him again, it ain't so bad. You see, the old Rocky was back before he was scared, before he didn't want it, he didn't have the eye of the tiger. But now, he said, you give me your best because I am going to win. Now, why did I go through all that? Well, I like the movie. But I saw in my ministry that I had lost the eye of the tiger. And that may sound cliche, that may sound trite. But I remember what it was like when I first wanted to be an evangelist. I remember what it was like when I first wanted to, to move up to Boston and to train for the ministry there. And I went there and I was not on staff. Lisa and I had about $700 a month to live off of and both of us worked and trained full time in the ministry, but I wanted it. And we would work long days and long nights and hard hours and we'd always get with people and every time we were together we'd take someone, we'd study the Bible with them, we'd lead people to Christ and we were fruitful, we were working hard and we wanted and we wanted and I was added to the staff and I kept on working hard but over the last three years I can see in my life that I hadn't been working a few weeks ago, I hadn't been working as hard as I was in the beginning. Because even though I wouldn't have admitted it, I thought, well, now I'm an evangelist. Now I am a leader. You know, now you can sort of coast. Now you can sort of ride on your, uh, on your laurels, you know, rest on your laurels a little bit. And I lost that sharpness, that hunger, that thirst. And I thought, Johnson, you got to change. You got to get back to the basics. And you see, this is what Paul is telling Timothy. Remember Jesus Christ. Get back to the basics. You see, Christians have got to be self-starters, especially ministers. I believe that ministers are the greatest men in the world. Now, that might sound, you know, uh, terribly one-sided. I've got a couple of amens in here from a couple of ministers. But anyway, I believe that ministers are good guys. But ministers have got to be people that are self-motivated, that are, that are thirsty, and our motivation has got to constantly come from remembering Jesus. This is what quiet times are all about. I know God commands us to pray and commands us to study. I know we need to do it to have a close relationship with Him. But what God is trying to get us to do is say, Hey, remember me? Remember what it's all about? He's trying to keep our motivation straight. And so today, in the last part of our class here, is I just want to hit some things that I believe that we can remember from the life of Jesus and freshen our ministry up. I think we can. The first thing, I think we need to remember Jesus in His discipling. Remember Jesus? Remember his discipling? There's three things that I've become convinced in the last few weeks that are necessary in order to disciple a person. One, that person has got to believe that you believe in them. More than anything else, that person has got to believe that you believe in them, heart and soul, that you are in their corner, that you're fighting for them, that you're pulling for them, that you think they've got it, that they've got what it takes, and that with God they're going to be able to do fantastic things. They've got to know that you believe in them. Secondly, that person has got to believe that you have their best interest in mind. That whatever you're out for in their relationship, there's just one thing that you're out for. And that is whatever is going to be best for them, that you are out for their best interest. And the third thing is that person has got to believe that your judgment is better than their judgment. Now, I'm just telling you, you know, like it is. 
They've got to believe that your judgment in the Lord is better than their judgment. After all, you're deciphering them. You see what Jesus instructs us to do in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, when he tells us to go and make disciples of all nations, to baptize them, and then to teach them everything he's commanded. He doesn't just say to teach them what he's commanded, does he? He says, teach them to obey what has been commanded. You see, as ministers or as disciples or whatever you want to call yourself here, if you want to disciple somebody else to the Lord, then you're not just trying to teach them what God said. You do that. But you teach them how to obey what God has said. In order to disciple people, then we've got to have these three things straighten out our relationship. They've got to be open to our advice, open to our opinion, and we've got to be strictly, you know, trying to just give them advice from, from God, advice, you know, good counsel from the Bible. But now I want to say this, and I'll go on, is, is if we haven't already decided to, it is past time for us to get these squeamish feelings about saying, well, I, I don't want to tell someone to follow me, you know, as, as I follow Christ. Don't follow me. Don't look at me. I'm going to be a humble brother and, you know, just be like Jesus. It's time for us to put that out of our vocabulary to be like Paul and say, you follow me like I'm following Christ. And believe me, believe me, they'll point, if you challenge somebody like that, they'll point out the mistakes you make. Don't worry about them imitating the bad things you do. There will be a mirror reflection. They will pick up some of your bad habits, but they'll also challenge you on your bad habits. We need to have men in the church. We need to have ministers. We need to be ministers that are going to say, look, follow me like I'm following Christ. It's got to be that way. And so I think these are three things that we've got to have straightened out in order to have these sort of relationships. Secondly, I think as we look to Jesus in discipling people, I think we need to look at, at how did he do it. You know, Jesus spent very little one-on-one -on -one time with people. And I'm a, a, an advocate of, of praying together, having prayer relationships where daily, you know, you, you keep in touch, you encourage one another, and you pray together. But you know, as you look in the discipling of Jesus Christ, you see very little one-on-one -on -one time like that. I think there's a couple of reasons for it. One, I think it was just a matter of, of him really spreading himself out too thin to do that. And of course, any of you that have tried to disciple a large number of people, you know how that is. You know how that can spread you out. But secondly... Just the one-on-one -on -one leaves out a lot of group dynamics. You see, Jesus worked with a group of men, and there were three of them that he was even closer to than the rest, perhaps, with Peter, James, and John. But even with that, you just see, when he got with them, it was usually in a smaller group. Jesus worked with these men and discipled them because he wanted them to go out and to spread the gospel to the rest of the world, to, to convert the world. And the way that he did it was, first of all, through these group dynamics. He would take them along with him. They would follow him wherever that he went, and he would teach. And then not only did he teach them, but then they talked among themselves. And you see this group dynamics that takes place. And you remember the time that, uh, that James and John wanted to sit on the right and the left-hand side of Jesus? Now, Jesus just told them that wasn't in their place, didn't they? That's pretty much what Jesus says. No, it's, it's been given to somebody else. What did the other apostles do? They rebuked the daylights out of those guys. You see, not only did Jesus, you know, have an instruction there, but the other apostles, it says they were, uh, they were indignant, you know, with the things they said. Now, I'm not encouraging, you know, us having groups to get indignant with one another. All I'm saying is that this group of men, they would hear from Jesus, and then among themselves, they would, uh, they would talk about it, they'd have their, uh, their little forum on it, you know, and, and then they'd go out and do a lot of these things. Now, something that we started in the ministry at Lexington are what are being called discipleship circles. And basically, all a discipleship circle is, is a group of anywhere from 8 to 14 people that get together. And it is directed. It does have a leader. And it would either be a Bible talk leader or one of the evangelists or the elders that would lead a group like this. But these groups will get together, and it's, it's almost, you know, for, uh, for just an easy reference, it's almost like a giant prayer partner time. And not only do you have, you know, a chance to, to direct the group and to talk about things that, that you need to discuss, but also there's a lot of group dynamics that goes on. You see, in the early days of, of building the church there at Lexington, there were about four of us that were real close. Uh, and we all wanted to go into ministry. There was, there was Doug Blau, there was Doug Arthur, there was Jim Lloyd, and there was myself. And we were all working there with Kip. Kip was discipling us and teaching us. And consequently, not only do we get with Kip and, and have a lot of time together in that way with the whole group, but then as four, we get back and start batting around the things that we were learning in the ministry. And we began to disciple each other in this way too. Well, now, this is the idea behind this group dynamics, just like with the apostles. Jesus, you know, not only taught these guys, but then they would talk these things out themselves. And so we get a group of people together. Uh, I have one group, the MIT, all the brothers at MIT. We crowd into my living room. And we get together and we just talk about things just like I would in prayer partners and have people to, uh, give people the opportunity to bring up problems that they're having, give them the, uh, the opportunity to bring up victories that they're having. And I'll talk in just a second more specifically what we, we discuss about. But uh, this way, I mean, imagine if in your church, if in your congregation of the Lord's church, wherever you are, imagine if everybody in the church 
was able to pray with one of the ministers or one of the elders or one of the Bible talk leaders. That's what this accomplishes. Everybody in the church has contact at least once a week in a very intimate, personal, spiritual way with someone that's in leadership. And when we get together, what we discuss, you know, one is, is we set goals. And, and every discipleship group that I lead or that I've been involved in, the goal is automatically set and talked about that everybody in the group has set the goal that they're going to be a Bible talk leader before the year is over. That's just one of the set goals. And we talk about it, we work on things, whatever it's going to take to get on that point. Now, can you imagine 14 people? Can you imagine after one year, if you've got 14 new Bible talk leaders? And just imagine over the last, uh, over the last three, uh, three years and two months, we've had uh, 610 baptisms out of the church out there. Now, I praise the Lord for that. That's God's glory. But I want to show you this. Imagine you've got 14 new Bible talk leaders, and you've got 100 new Christians. You've got 14 new Bible talks right there, spread out to 14 different places. Do you see how it works? More and more people are coming to the Lord that way. And so automatically in this discipleship group, we set the goal of being a Bible talk leader, and then we work towards meeting that goal. Secondly, we just discuss any need there is in the congregation. Uh, with the MIT guys, I discuss any needs that we have on that campus, since that is one of the campuses that I'm over. Any, any needs that they have in their personal spiritual life, we discuss the needs there in that time in this large group. We pray together, uh, and we challenge. I can't, remember, I can't help but remember the first time that we got together there in my living room a lot of the guys, because they were from several different Bible talks on campus, they didn't really know each other. And this was another reason for getting together in a group, so they could build stronger relationships and be able to have the sort of challenging that, that all of us young evangelists had in the beginning days there at the church. And so I said, well, let's just go around the room and everyone say what you think are the strong points and the weak points of the person sitting uh, to your left. And so it went around the room. And finally, you know, it came around to the brother that's sitting right next to me. And I thought, this is going to be easy. He doesn't know me very well, you know. <laughs> and uh, then he went into all my strong points that he saw, you know, and he, and he told me, you know, all the, all the things you like to hear. And I thought, well, that'll be about all he says. Then I'll just say he doesn't know me. But then he went into all the weak points that he'd seen, you know, even at a distance, you know. And he, and he, but he began to talk about the things that he saw that he thought maybe I could change. And then we talked about it. I said, okay, I said, here's the deal we make in this group. I challenge you, you challenge me. This is the way it's supposed to be with brothers. Just like in the Proverbs, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens one another. And so this is the idea of this group, this discipleship group or whatever you want to call it. Look at Jesus and how he discipled people. And let's try to, to freshen our ministries up by imitating Jesus and his discipling. Uh, secondly, imitate Jesus and his innovation. Remember Matthew chapter 9, verse 17, where Jesus talked about the wine and the wine skins. You've got one thing that's extremely important. As we learned this morning in our sermon, we can use the word essential. The wine is essential. That's the gospel of Jesus. He says you cannot put new wine in old wine skins, else it would burst. You've got to put new wine in new wine skins. Okay, the wine is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what Jesus was referring to was that his gospel, his good news, would not fit in to the traditional Judaism of that day. In fact, Jesus had come to fulfill that. But the new wine, the essential, was the gospel, the container was secondary. primary thing we cannot change, you know, and I appreciate Bill pointing that out, is that we can't change the gospel. It's here to stay. It's, that's the way it's always going to be. But we need to be innovative, like Jesus was, in the ways that we express the gospel to get it out to people so, they'll be, so that people who are hungering and thirsting for it, that they'll hear it, and those that aren't hungering and thirsting for it will develop an appetite for it. And a couple of things that we've done in the church out there in our innovation, incidentally, uh, all of us know what it means to be innovative, don't we? Uh, my wife is very innovative, Lisa. Those of you who haven't met her, uh, she tried for the longest time to get me to stop biting my nails. And nothing worked. And finally, she made me wear my shoes all the time. And uh, that'll sink in just a minute. Maybe I won't use that one tomorrow. But anyway, we got to be innovative. Like Jesus was innovative. And one of the things we started off there in the beginning of the church when we began to work here with the congregation was uh, every activity... There were no age divisions. Our, devotion, our devotionals were congregational devotionals. And for, uh, you know, you always shorten things in your terminology. We called it the Congo Devo. Congo Devo, that was everybody. You know, the whole church, adults, college students, uh, teenagers, everybody came to that devotional together every week. Every activity we planned, we had the whole church do it together. Uh, anything that was being taught, everyone learned it together. Everyone did it together. And so, you see, this way in the, in the very start, from the, from the beginning, there was unity that was being built on. And then as the church grew and grew, there was a need to break up in the groups, to, to specialize in specific needs. 
But the first thing we did is we started off doing things together. Uh, second thing that we did, instead of taking retreats and going off, you know, long distances, so many of our people lived, you know, uh, uh, at, at extremes from each other anyway, instead of having a retreat going away, we would have what we called a spiritual enrichment weekend. And we would invite a speaker or a guest speaker or two to come, you know, from another congregation and, uh, and to speak for us on a Friday night, a Saturday, and a Sunday. And then we'd invite all of our friends. And, and we decided from the very beginning that every activity the church had, no matter what it was, it was a visitor inviting function. Everything we do, we invite the visitors. And I believe that even sometimes when you need to talk about family matters, you know, and you need to keep things in the family and talk about the things that the church needs to work on real hard, that that might be a time you might not want to invite some people that haven't been to the church very often. We've found that everything that we've done, though, has been an open book to people, and our visitors have come, and it's helped the fruitfulness of the congregation because everything we do, we invite people to it. And so uh, this is one of the things, as a matter of fact, we have been having spiritual enrichment weekends. We'll continue doing it. We just had our first retreats uh, last uh, uh, two weeks ago. It's the first time we'd ever broken up into to four different groups that met on the same weekend. We had an adult retreat, and we had a, a single adult retreat, and a college retreat, and, and a teen retreat. But up until this time, we have done, done everything together in order, one, for the unity, uh, you know, and to be able to, to have the same teaching and to be able to spend that time together and, and to have all the combined vi visitors. And when we grew to a point that we needed specialization, that's what we did. We broke up and did that. A third thing that we we've, we've be begin to do that I believe is, is fairly innovative and that is some of the community mission work now. Obviously, the congregation is very mission-minded in its scope and its vision. But that mission work does not only extend to the, the far reaches of the world, uh, places like London and Tierra del Fuego, but also, you know, it, it reaches into it with our own community there around Boston. And one of the things that is exciting is to see a lot of our young brothers that have graduated from college and decided they want to stay in Boston and get jobs to be able to work with the church. They go into our, our single adult ministry, and one of the things we've encouraged them to do is to get a couple of people and move to an area, of the, the Boston area, to move out in one of the little towns or suburbs where there aren't any Christians and to begin a Bible talk out there. We had one guy that did this, just uh, two brothers went down to the south shore of Boston and began a Bible talk in a town called Quincy. And the first Bible talks, all the, all the first four Bible talks they've had so far have all been the double figures as far as visitors. Had 15, 16, 17 people, you know, that have come to hear the Bible being studied there in their homes. And so we've just got some other people that are excited about going and starting ministries in another place. One of the brothers that, uh, that I led to the Lord has uh, just began a, a Bible study up in Salem, Massachusetts. He moved up to Salem, and now he's going to start one there, which will eventually uh, develop into another campus ministry for the church there at Salem State. And so we've got people that are excited about going out, you know, and beginning their own mission work. They get the maps of the town. They plot it out just like they're, you know, they're going on a missionary journey because that, in fact, is what it is. And this has been able to, to build the church up, to strengthen the church, and launch out in some more frontiers for evangelism. The third thing we need to imitate Jesus in is in, his, is in our discipline. Uh, I'll just talk about this for a second and go on for sake of time. But, uh, you know, you look at Jesus at his life and his ministry, and you wonder, when did the guy ever sleep? Uh, we see, you know, him up late at night, you know, counseling and teaching. We see him early in the morning going to the mountain to pray. In fact, one of the few times we find Jesus sleeping, his disciples go and wake him up down there in the boat. I mean, the guy was just, you know, always just going flat out at a flat out rate. But I think back to the beginning of the ministry, you know, once again, when I first was, was wanting to go into the ministry and training for it, then, then uh, I was so eager and so disciplined. You talk about I'm, uh, not complaining about the hours that you put in. I was so excited to get off to a study, and I'd, I'd always be, you know, so anxious to leave. Sometimes, you know, I'd, I'd go out so fast that I'd, I'd, I'd slam Lisa and kiss the door and then go to my next appointment and just, you know, the, the, the eagerness to be out there to work hard. I won't use that one tomorrow either. But anyway, the eagerness... And one of the things that I found now trying to go back to the basics in my life, trying to get back to, to that, that zeal that I had in the beginning, is uh, one of the things with my discipline is, uh, is I'm not, first of all, let me say, I'm not a very disciplined person by nature. Some people are by nature. Some people aren't by nature. By nature, I'm not a very disciplined person. But because Jesus was disciplined, I want to be that way. And that gives me a vision for myself, and, and that's, that's the goal I, I, I look after, wanting to be like Jesus. And so what I do most of my appointments, and trying to get back to the basics, I've decided to put a lot more time into my disciples, the guys that I am working with, and they're the Lord's disciples, for those of you that get the tape and maybe don't know what I'm mean, meaning here, but when I say my disciples, I mean people that I am trying to disciple the Lord. And I've been trying to put in late nights with these guys and, and to pump time in on them, so that, that often you know, leaves you drained, you know, and it comes down to two in the morning or something like that. And, and I, I know me, that if I stay up that late, 
the natural tendency for this old body is not to get up in the morning. So what I do is to sort of inflict discipline on myself, if I can use that word. And that is I always plan, uh, you know, somewhere between 7 and 8 o'clock an appointment. And uh, this, this last week, I knew it was going to be a place, so I set up a study with the guy that was on vacation. Uh, his wife has recently become a Christian. His son became a Christian. His other son became a Christian. So now we're, we're studying the Bible with him, and I knew he was on vacation. So I said, how about if I come by your house at 8 in the morning, knowing that I'd be up till 3.30 the, the, the night before? Because I wanted to inflict this discipline on myself. I wanted to get with him and spend the time there. And so we need to emulate Jesus. I think that Jesus, I don't know if he worked this out intentionally. I believe that everything that Christ did, there was a plan to it. But, but you look at Jesus, his schedule didn't allow him a lot of time, did it? He just had three years to get all these things accomplished, and he was always moving from one point to the next. He had to be places. I think as, as ministers, that might be a good rule of thumb for us too. Fourth thing, and I won't take much time here either, is that's imitate Jesus in his teaching. So many times, we assume that the Christians in our congregations know more about the Bible than they do. And we make quick references to things in our Bible talks that we lead or in the sermons that we teach. And uh, I think, you know, just like Jesus, you see that Jesus was always willing to have the in-depth teaching. Even when he taught parables there in Matthew 13 that might have went over everyone's head, he comes back and he explains the depth and the meaning of those things. And I look at my own sermons, you know, over the, over the past three years and see how they've changed because I grew up around the church. And it seems like nothing to refer to something in the Old Testament and instantly think that everybody knows who Elijah is or to instantly think that everybody knows what the old law was. And I found that something that has meant a lot to the people in my Bible talks or the, the Christians in, in the church is because there's so many young Christians that these things are new is that just to explain things in detail, to take the time to put the deep teaching into our sermons. I believe that this is something that's very necessary. I won't say anything else about that at this point. The fifth thing is in serving. Serving like Jesus. Obviously, Jesus was a foot-washing person. He washed his disciples' feet. And in doing this, he set the standard for how they should serve one another. But, you know, I looked at my own life, and going back to the basics for me, and I thought, you know, this is, this is something that isn't fresh, that, that shouldn't be fresh, but is fresh to a lot of us, and that is for leaders to be servants. You know... This is really a fresh idea. Now, it's been in the Bible a long time. We teach it a lot, but it's so easy for the leaders to end up not being the servants in the church. And the leaders are supposed to be out there setting the example of servitude to the rest of the congregation. And I was just talking with one of the brothers a couple of weeks ago, and I was sharing about this, this person that wasn't a Christian that I was working with. And I'd been sharing about my frustration in my relationships with brothers I was trying to disciple. This goes back a, a month or so. And I've been sharing about my frustration about that, and then I turn around and I begin to say, yeah, you know, this guy that I'm studying the Bible with, I got up at 6 the other morning and went over and spent this time with him, you know, over at this building where he's working out, and we talked, and, and all this, and the brother said, Steve, that's exactly it. He said, that's great that you spent that time with that non-Christian. That doesn't need to change. That needs to be that way. Don't change that at all. He says, but have you ever thought what it would be like to some of these brothers you're working with if you came to their house early in the morning to do something with them? Have you ever thought what it would mean to them if you did something like that to serve them, to spend that time with them, to show them how special and how important they were to you? And I'm thankful that I'm in a congregation of leaders that it didn't take that long to catch on as it did me. I think of Elena, you know, Kip's wife. And here, Elena is expecting their second child, uh, and uh, she was, she's pregnant. And one of the other women has had her baby recently, and Elena cooks the dinner and goes over and serves the dinner to this other woman. Now, there are a lot of other people in the church that could have done it. They could have had more time, and it could have been a lot, a lot easier on than for Elena to do it. But Elena wanted to serve, and she set that example of servitude. Uh, I think of my wife. It was nothing for anyone to, to ask Lisa, for Lisa to volunteer, actually, to go to the airport at 5.30 in the morning to take one of the sisters in her Bible talk to the airport. But now, you see, this is the thing that as leaders, it's easy to slug off into, as, as so many people serve us and want to do things for us, that we forget that we're supposed to be out there setting the pace and serving. I didn't forget in the beginning, in the beginning of my ministry, that's what it was all about. I wanted to serve like Jesus. And so perhaps one of the things that we can really think about is our servitude in our ministries in different places. The sixth thing is meeting needs. Get back to the basics and imitate Jesus in meeting needs. Jesus always met needs. In John 3, he met Nicodemus' needs. John 4, he met the needs of the woman by the well. John 8, he met the, the, the needs of the woman uh, that was called in adultery. Jesus was always meeting the needs of people. I've decided that in my ministry, I want everything that I do to be for purpose. 
I want everything to have a purpose. And in that purpose, I want to always be able to meet the needs like Christ met needs. Now, I know that I'm not going to do it all the time. I want to strive for it. That's my goal. But Jesus was always meeting people's needs. We need to meet needs of the people in our Bible talks. And, and a lot of these canned Bible talks, a lot of the canned ideas that we have, we need to throw some of them out and just work it. How can we work at meeting the needs of the people that are here right now? second thing that we need to work on meeting needs are in the sermons, those of you guys that are preaching. A lot of our sermons need to be directed in practical, specific ways to the needs of the people. The third thing, and I wanted to share, this is in our devotionals. Uh, lots of times our devotionals are not always meeting the needs of people. We get together, we sing a few songs, we pray because we're supposed to be devoting ourselves to God, which we are. But we don't get specific and practical and meet the needs. One of the devotionals we did a few weeks ago uh, that to me was very exciting is we broke up in our, our college group and uh, into several different groups, and we decided that we're going to write an epistle. You with me so far? We're going to write a letter to the church at Lexington. And what it was going to be, it was going to be a letter from somebody else, from another place, written to encourage the college group at the Lexington Church of Christ. And so at that format, that's what we did. We began to work on this letter. And uh, the, the letter in my group uh, was from a guy named Petrov, who was the campus minister in Moscow, who had been converted in London, England, by two of the guys that we sent off as missionaries. It was a creative thing. But... Uh, the idea is, is in this group while we're preparing that letter, all the guys were throwing out the ideas, the needs that we had. You know, he can write and tell us, encourage us about this and encourage us about that and, and change this and work on this. And so by the time we'd written that letter, really what it had been, had been everyone was ministering to each other, talking about the things that needed to change, the things we need to be encouraged to, to work harder on. And so that was an extremely encouraging and challenging devotional. Uh, another devotional we did one night, which just surprised everybody, is when the preachers got up. And instead of just challenging the church, we thanked the church and praised the church uh, for all the good things that have been going on. Four of us, we just went around and we took turns. And, and in essence, we thanked about 350, 400 people back in those days when we had that devotional. And we brought out things that people had done, things that people had done that they thought no one else even knew about, and praised them and gave honor as honor was due in the Lord to those people at that time. And it's a very edifying devotional, very encouraging and very uplift uplifting, and it met the needs at that moment. The seventh thing, and I'm wrapping up here, is we need to imitate Jesus in our ministries by overcoming moods. Overcoming our own moodiness. You don't read about being burned out in the Bible. You don't read Paul, you know, encouraging Timothy, don't get burned out or don't work too hard that you get burned out or anything like that. It's, it's just not in there. Instead, you read, you know, Paul saying uh, in, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, he says, I fought, I finished, and I've kept. I fought the good fight, I finished the course, I've kept the faith. You see that Paul, because of giving 110% in his life, of giving it all, of working hard, of, of sacrificing, then he had that to overcome his moods. I mean, you look at Jesus. Do you think Jesus was ever discouraged? Absolutely. And you look at Jesus there in Matthew chapter 4 when he was tempted by the devil. I always thought that the way that he overcame the temptations was because he knew...